So our uh, next topic is uh, motivation, a part of section two, people and organizations, and uh, very popular with the with the examiners, with the paper setters, motivation. And in this regard, the candidates are required to to cover seven different theories. Of course, there are numerous social scientists, motivational theorists who have expressed their views regarding, uh, regarding motivation. And uh, some of them, they focused on financial rewards. Others, they were more in uh, you know, favor of non-financial rewards. So one by one, we'll go through these, these seven theories. And in this particular session, in this lecture, I should be able to cover three. And these obviously will be followed by uh, subsequent um, lectures on on the remaining theories. Altogether, there are this seven of these that we have to uh, go through. So, as usual, we have to define the key term first. And you have to develop this habit when you're attempting a question also. Always try to define the key term right in the beginning. And always try to identify the problem if it's a, it's a data response passage or it's a case study. And refer to the passage give the background and I've been discussing this previously also this is like a checklist whenever you're attempting a question in the introductory paragraph so defining the key term motivation is simply you know it's a driving force it's a driving force that enhances staff performance it's a driving force that enhances staff performance simple definition and uh, obviously this is done this is accomplished enhancing staff performance, this is accomplished with the help of uh, multiple financial and non-financial rewards. Financial rewards in which there's a direct involvement of money or cash, and non-financial rewards are the non-monetary incentives like fringe benefits or you know teamwork, training, etc. So the first theory in this connection is by Victor Vroom. Vroom's expectancy theory. You are required to Memorize the names of these social scientists along with the title of the respective theory also, right? So Vroom's expectancy theory is number one. Uh, Vroom basically, he used a simple formula, a simple mathematical formula to describe, you know, his, uh, his, his, his viewpoint regarding the, the factors that can possibly motivate workers to perform at their optimum level. So he simply says, and he uses this formula, the formula is a simple one, it says, F is equal to V into E. F is equal to V into E, that's the formula. And uh, F is the, is the motivating force, you can say F is motivation, V is valence, V stands for valence, and E for expectancy. The theory is called, is also called the expectancy theory. The so F is equal to, a motivating force is equal to valence into expectancy. So basically what he is suggesting is that you know motivation depends largely on these two factors it depends on these two factors valence and expectancy higher the valence higher the motivation level higher the expectancy higher the motivation so basically motivation is a product of valence and expectancy so all you need to do when you're discussing this theory just describe valence and expectancy and try to establish a link between these and the level of motivation. So valence is basically the value, or you can say it is the worth of a goal. It is the worth of a goal, you know, in the eyes of a particular individual. The worth, the value, the significance of a goal, the importance of a goal, you know, to a certain individual, to a worker, to an employee. That is valence. So according to Vroom, Victor Vroom, if a worker understands the valence, if he understands the value or the worth of a goal or a task that is assigned to him, if, if you understand the significance of that task or the importance of that goal, automatically he will start taking it seriously. He will, he, he will, he will give it his best shot and he will try to accomplish it or achieve it using all his skills and his abilities. Right? I'll, I'll try and explain with the help of a simple example. For instance, you know, um, a worker, an employee, he 
understands the importance of a of a particular target that he's required to meet that you know if i meet this target if i achieve this goal this objective i'll be promoted next year on the basis of my performance right or i'll get a, a pay raise for instance as a result of this so that means he has understood the significance of that goal the valence right and now since he fully understands and he realizes how important it is to achieve that particular goal he will give it his his his, his best he, he will make make a make a serious effort and he will try to make sure that no stone is left unturned when he tries to achieve that particular goal because he's understood the value or the worth of that goal this is what valence is all about it's very simple you just need a paragraph for this this particular theory right so hire the valence hire the motivation right number 2 is expectancy motivation is a product of looking at the formula valence and expectancy expectancy is just to have high expectations or just to have you know um you know some confidence in your own abilities that is expectancy you need to have confidence in your abilities you need to have you know faith in in you know the the potential that you have that you know if if i make a serious effort if if i give it my 100% i will achieve success for sure you need to enjoy that sense of confidence that my effort you know the 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 effort i am making to achieve a particular goal or particular objective this will certainly lead to a positive outcome you need to have that faith that confidence right okay my effort will lead to a positive outcome so you have to be confident about the positive outcome of of the the, the efforts that you are making this is expectancy so basically according to room motivation or the level of motivation simply depends on valence and expectancy valence understanding the value or worth of a goal expectancy having faith in your own abilities having confidence that your you know your your effort will prove to be fruitful and it will lead to success this is what determines the the motivation level in the long run right so higher the valence higher the motivation higher the expectations higher the expectancy higher the motivation level. right this is what motivation is all about uh, as as recommended by room in his expectancy theory right that's number one okay now right after room we need to discuss another important theory by abraham maslow and it is called maslow's hierarchy of needs number one is room's expectancy theory and number two is maslow's hierarchy of needs okay so maslow in, in in the hierarchy of needs theory the word hierarchy i think in itself it it suggests that all these needs they have to be discussed in a certain order hierarchy placed in 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 the in the order of importance so he says the following five needs must be taken care of or they must be fulfilled by the employers or by the managers if they wish to have a motivated workforce so the first one on the list the hierarchy of needs is the physiological needs right physiological needs are the basic human needs the basic human needs like food shelter and clothing these are physiological needs right so it makes a lot of sense when maslow says that it is essential that the managers the employers they fulfill the physiological needs of their workers their workers they should have an access you know to to food shelter and clothing the basic needs have to be fulfilled obviously you know if a worker while you know while while he's 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 performing his his duties there and you know he is unable to manage food shelter and clothing then what is he doing there this is the you know these 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 are basic human needs so either the managers they should provide them with the actual facilities in kind give them food or a place where they can live or you know clothing or make sure that you know the salary structure is designed in such a way that he is able to manage food shelter and clothing that's number 1 physiological needs are followed by security needs right so we must keep in mind that when he uses the word security 
Maslow, he is referring to security in the literal sense also, safety, but more importantly, job security. Job security, right? So, you know, a worker should be able to work in a well-protected, safe environment. That goes without saying, in the literal sense, but job security is essential. You know, job security, it simply guarantees that there's a proper long-term contract between the employer and the employee. And there are certain rules and regulations that govern that contract. And for instance, the most important part of this, you know, the, the job security clause is that if, a, if the employer wants a particular worker to leave, he has to be served with a notice first. Right? Before, you know, if you decide, you know, that this worker has to be laid off, he can't be just, you know, asked to leave without being served with the notice first. You know, there's a particular, there's a, there's a certain time, usually, you know, it's two to three months, that your services will not be required, you know, uh, March onwards, for instance, so that he can make arrangements for a new job. And he's not always under stress that, you know, there's all, I might lose my job. And he, in such a situation, if he does not enjoy that peace of mind, he won't be able to focus on what he's doing wholeheartedly, right? So job security must be guaranteed. And if you analyze this carefully, job security safeguards the interests of not only the employee, the employer also. You know, it goes both ways. If the employee wishes to leave, he has to inform the employers beforehand so that they can make arrangements and they can find a substitute. So basically, it protects the rights or safeguards the interests of both the parties. Job security must be guaranteed. And uh, of course, if, if somebody, an employer, actually wants a, an immediate replacement, that's also a possibility. Then there's a procedure in this case also. Then maybe, you know, uh, advanced salary might be given to that particular employee if, he, if, if they want him to leave right away. So obviously job security plays a key role in motivating the workers and it ensures that, you know, there's a high degree of commitment and they can focus on what they're doing, like I just said, wholeheartedly. But also try to remember this job security clause, it comes into effect, you know, under, under normal circumstances, you know, for instance, um, if there has been a, a severe or a serious violation of the code of discipline, for instance, then then, then obviously, you know, if he's, he was involved in some sort of mis misconduct or something that we call gross misconduct, stealing, etc., or embezzlement of funds or some or violation of, you know, such, such intensity, then obviously this is a case that leads to dismissal. When you dismiss from the job and your services are terminated, then obviously that's a separate, that's a different story. But in normal circumstances, a notice has to be served, right? So job security is followed by belonging needs. After security needs, their belonging needs. So belonging needs, you know, uh, according to Maslow, a sense of belonging must develop. You know, the workers, uh, the, the, the employers, they should treat their workers in such a way that they feel that they are an integral part of the organization. A worker shouldn't feel that he's just a paid employee. He should know and he should feel, he should be treated in that way, that he's an important part of the organization. He means something to the, to the, to the organization, to the employer, right? So he, he has to be treated nicely with courtesy, not as if, you know, he is just a, just a paid employee or just a piece of equipment or something, right? So belonging needs must also be fulfilled if you want to have a motivated workforce. After belonging needs, we have esteem needs. Esteem needs, you know, uh, we, 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 we all need recognition in life. We all need appreciation in life, admiration in life, right? So the employees, when they, when they perform the way they're supposed to and they meet their targets and they accomplish the, the, the tasks that have been um, assigned to them or they achieve the, the, the goals that were set for them, they should be recognized for, for this good performance. There has to be some sort of appreciation from the, you know, the, the employers. And this appreciation could be in the shape of financial rewards or non-financial rewards. You know, if a worker proves to be a high achiever, maybe there should be a bonus for him or a pay raise or something. But you know, even if the employer can't afford to do that, for whatever reason, financial constraints or you know, something else, there has to be you know, some sort of appreciation. Maybe, you know, if nothing else, a few kind words, a few kind words in the presence of his colleagues 
even that can do wonders. So some sort of recognition or, you know, some sort of appreciation has to be there. And that will certainly, that like I said, it can do wonders for the motivation level of that particular worker. And in the future also, he will try to continue with his, with his uh, good performance, right? It's good for his self-esteem. And the last one is self-actualization. Self-actualization states that, you know, uh, a worker, uh, he should be allowed to control his way of working. You know, he should be allowed to control his way of working and any, any kind of unnecessary interference must be avoided. Unnecessary interference from your superiors, it always, it has a disincentive effect. It discourages people, it discourages employees, it demoralizes them, it demotivates them. So in self-actualization, you have to show some confidence, pose some confidence in the abilities of your subordinates. Let them control their way, their way of working to a certain extent, right? Let them know that, you know, you, you have confidence in their abilities. And uh, as a result, if he's responsible enough, he will try to come up to the expectations of his employers. Self-actualization is important. You know, either promote him if you, if, you, if you can and let him take a few decisions himself without any unnecessary interference. Or even if, you know, promotion is not there, while working in the same capacity, there should be less interference. Letting him control his way of working. That is self actualization <clears throat> Right? So basically, uh, in, in, in the same order, physiological needs, security needs, belonging needs, esteem needs, and self actualization needs, they must be taken care of, they must be met by the employers if they want to have a motivated workforce. Right? So we've discussed Room's expectancy theory. And this was followed by Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So in this lecture, I I'm going to cover one more. And I want you to remember that there are seven theories altogether that we will be discussing. But always try to discuss Herzberg, Herzberg's hygiene theory right after Maslow. This, this, should, be, this prove to, should prove to be a, you know, a useful piece of advice. You can, you can rearrange, you can change the order of all these theories if you want to, but it is recommended that Maslow should be followed by Herzberg. If Maslow is number six, Herzberg should be seven. If Maslow, like in our case, it was the second theory that we discussed, Herzberg should be number three. Because there is, there, there's, there, there's a bit of overlapping between these two. This will help you save time also, and it will make, make it easier for you to describe these theories uh, more effectively, right? To so always try to discuss Herzberg right after Maslow and I'll just explain why. So Herzberg's hygiene theory also known as the two-factor theory. Hygiene theory or two-factor theory. So you know Herzberg says all, all, all of these obviously they're, they're all social scientists and they the ultimate goal is the same to have a motivated workforce but the route that they take the approach might be different might vary from social scientist to social scientist. Okay, so according to Herzberg, Frederick Herzberg's hygiene theory is what we're discussing here. There are two sets of factors, you know, they're the two different groups, two categories, the two sets of factors that can have an influence, that can have an impact on the motivation level of workers, right? The first set, he calls these, he calls them hygiene factors. The first set of factors, they are hygiene factors, right? And the other one, the motivators or the motivating factors. So in order to understand what these hygiene factors are, we should keep in mind that, you know, the term refers to, 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 to those factors, factors that are so important that, you know, in the absence of these, a worker shouldn't even accept the job. Hygiene factors, they're essential. They're so important. You can say they're like a, like a prerequisite for a job, for accepting a job. That if these hygiene factors are missing, then the worker shouldn't even be working there. He shouldn't even accept the job in the absence of these hygiene factors. Like I said, it's like a prerequisite, a basic condition that has to be met by the employers if they want to hire someone, right? And now I'll, I'll explain why, the, why, why Herzberg's hygiene theory should always be discussed after Maslow, we just discussed Maslow, 
Maslow's first three needs, physiological needs, security needs, belonging needs. Maslow's first three needs basically are Herzberg's hygiene factors, simple as that. So if you maintain the same, you know, order, you won't have to discuss these again. That is why I was suggesting and I'm strongly recommending that you must discuss Herzberg right after Maslow. You would simply write because we've, if you just discuss Maslow, there's no need to discuss physiological needs, security needs, belonging needs again. You can simply refer to the previous theory that Maslow's first three needs are Herzberg's hygiene factors. So basically what Herzberg is saying that if physiological needs are not met, if job security is not guaranteed, if belonging needs are not fulfilled, these are the hygiene factors, the prerequisites. So in the absence of these, the worker shouldn't even accept the job. He shouldn't even be working there. Right? This, this, is, this is how you, you, you describe these hygiene factors by referring to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Got it? Now the second category, the second set of factors, those are the motivators. Right? The motivators or the, the motivating factors. So, according to uh, Frederick Herzberg, motivators are the factors that, you know, if these are missing, the worker should still work there, he should, you know, continue working there. It, it, it is not like we discussed in the case of hygiene factors. Okay, if hygiene factors are missing, he shouldn't work. But if the motivators are missing, the worker will still work or he should work. But if these are guaranteed, the motivators, if these are guaranteed, then the worker will become a high achiever as a result of this. Right? In the absence of these motivators, he would still work, but you know, he would be uh, a mediocre worker. His performance would be mediocre, an average performer. But if the motivators are guaranteed, then the worker, you will, you know, he will go that extra mile and he will try and become a high, high achiever. His performance will be an above average one if these are offered to him. That is the significance of motivation. And needless to say, you, you, you must have guessed by now that Maslow's need number four and five are Herzberg's motivators. Maslow's need number four, esteem needs, and need number five, self-actualization. These are Herzberg's motivators. So if the esteem needs are not fulfilled or the self-actualization is not there, the worker will still work but it will be, like I said, a mediocre performance, an average performance. But if his, his esteem needs are being fulfilled, we just discussed esteem needs, the, his, his good performance is being recognized, and if self-actualization is there, he's allowed to control his way of working, this will go a long way in motivating the worker to an extent that, you know, he becomes a high achiever, and he is in a position to, or at least he tries to, give an exceptional performance or an extraordinary performance. These are motivators, right? Hygiene factors, motivators, like I said, it will, be, uh, it will be quite convenient for you if you approach this particular theory, these two theories in this way. Discuss Maslow in detail, followed by Herzberg, and show the, the, the correlation, and straight away move on to the next theory if you have to discuss, right? So in this particular session, we've managed to cover Vroom's expectancy theory, in which he focuses on valence and expectancy. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, in which we went through those five needs that must be taken care of, and Herzberg's hygiene factors, in which he distinguishes between the hygiene factors and the motivators. And we also try to establish a link between Herzberg and Maslow. In the subsequent lectures, I'll uh, try and cover the remaining four theories also. All right. This is it.